Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Today's chapel speaker is Dr. Daryl Bach, who serves as research professor of New Testament studies and professor of spiritual development and culture here at DTS. He has earned international recognition as a Humboldt scholar from Tübingen University in Germany and for his work in uh, the, uh, the tome of uh, the Luke Acts uh, comparative set that he has done, as well as in his uh, Jesus examination before the Jews in the trials of Jesus. He is a world uh, recognized scholar in New Testament studies and especially his work in studying the historical backgrounds of the person of Christ. He's been president of the Evangelical Theological Society for 2000, 2001, a uh, calendar year and serves as a corresponding editor at large for Christianity Today. His articles appear in leading journals and periodicals, including many secular publications, such as the Los Angeles Times, the Dallas Morning News. He's been a New York Times best-selling author in nonfiction. He's been an elder and serves as elder emeritus at Trinity Fellowship Church in Dallas. He and his wife Sally have three children and two uh, grandchildren. Uh, wherever I am, uh, those who are uh, mixing it up in evangelical scholarship and even beyond have uh, recognized Darrow for his great contribution and especially his representation through Dallas Seminary. Uh, I want you to know we recently did a podcast. Uh, Dr. Bach is a part of that. Uh, Dr. Bingham and Dr. Uh, Rick Taylor from the Old Testament Studies Department and we brought three of them into the studio here in uh, Chafer Chapo and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and did a podcast on how uh, does an evangelical scholar who shares uh, our confessions of the faith and our doctrinal perspective, how do they mix it up in a broader uh, world of academia and represent Christ well? Uh, not only within uh, uh, organizations like the Evangelical Theological Society, but uh, SBL and beyond. And uh, how do you duke it out uh, for the truth in a world that doesn't accept our confessions. And it was a great uh, uh, podcast experience and that will be available on our website. And I would encourage all of you as students to listen to that as well. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons that I appreciate Daryl is his heart. His heart for the Lord, his heart for the church, his friendship, his uh, collegiality. And uh, I appreciate that he's a, a scholar who also has a great sense of humor. Uh, he roots for the Rockets, we forgive that. Uh, but uh, would you welcome Dr. Daryl Bach to our chapel this morning? Thank you. Well, I hope you all have recovered from the uh, snow. I was in Nashville and missed it all. But I'm glad because in Texas there's one attitude towards snow, and that is the faster I get through this, the better. And it doesn't work. So uh, it's a pleasure to be back and see that everyone survived. My topic this morning is the gospel. It's dear to me. My ministry began with Young Life as a leader at Austin High School in Austin, Texas, while I was at the University of Texas. Go, Austin, Austin High. Go, Austin, go. <laughs> and uh, the gospel's been near and dear to me ever since. And I really think that the church today is struggling to communicate the gospel clearly. So that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to do it by starting off with some pictures. And so I want to start off with this fella, Jimmy Cagney, that great theologian of the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> some of you may not know who Jimmy Cagney is. I am confident that the faculty knows him very well. Uh, the next illustration is for them and not for you. Uh, and Jimmy Cagney was a great actor of the 50s and 60s, really an actor of my parents here, really, versus mine. I'm trying to get myself as young as I can be. And in the midst of his acting, he often played tough guy parts. In fact, one of the most famous lines attached to Jimmy Cagney goes something like this, you dirty rat. You're the one who killed my brother. Now, Jimmy Cagney has said that he actually didn't say that line, so we're searching for the real historical Jimmy Cagney. <laughs> <laughs> I 
But sometimes I listen to the church present the gospel, trying to be sure that people are convicted of sin. And what I hear in the background is Jimmy Cagney's voice, you dirty rat, you shouldn't be doing that. And when I hear a message that's focused there, I ask myself, where is the good news in that? Or the second, and for this one, I'm going to let you figure it out. Who am I and what am I doing? That's Neo of the Matrix. <laughs> Faculty, ask your students after class, okay? <laughs> That's Neo of the Matrix, dodging bullets. And sometimes when I hear the gospel presented, what I hear is that the gospel is about avoiding going somewhere very warm and very uncomfortable. And I think to myself, the gospel isn't about a negative. The gospel isn't about avoiding something. The gospel is about receiving something. Or the third option, no picture for this one, it comes from evangelism explosion. You know, you gotta open up a conversation and get to the gospel somehow. So why not open it up this way? If you died today. Now think about opening a conversation that way. Isn't that a great way in? If you died today, and then you know how the rest of it goes. And again, I ask myself, is the gospel simply about being somewhere for a long time? A very long time. You know, I like to say that it all depends who you spend eternity with. I know lots of people, if they said to me, you get to spend eternity with this person, I would go, I would rather have, never mind. It's who you know and who you're with that's at the core. And that's what I want to look at. So turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 3. We're going to do a little bit of a sword drill. We're going to run through several passages. I'm going to try and string some things together for you. And I'm going to argue that the gospel is about more than death for sin. That when we talk about the gospel and we limit it to death for sin, what we've done is we've given us about half the gospel. We've made it clear how the way is clear to experience what the gospel offers, but we have come short in making it clear why the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news for more than simply my sins being forgiven, as important as forgiveness of sin is to get to the gospel. Look at Luke chapter 3. This is John the Baptist speaking. And in an introduction that is unique to the gospel of Luke in verse 15, the text reads, as the people were in expectation and all men questioned their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he might be the Christ, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but he is mightier than I is coming. The thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And in that answer is a passage as important to the gospel as John 3.16. Luke 3.16 is as important to the gospel as John 3.16, and here's why. John is telling us how we can know that the Christ and the new era has come. We can know that the Christ and the new era has come when the one who brings the Spirit brings the Spirit of God to empower God's people according to the promise of the new era. That is what John is saying. Now, I know that some people may doubt that's what John is saying, so that's why I want to marshal the rest of the passages I want to look at. Turn with me next to Luke 24. Here, Jesus appears, and as he appears and speaks with his disciples in a resurrection appearance, he makes the point that what he has done is what the Scripture taught. Verse 44, he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. In other words, he's telling an old story. 
Then they, uh, he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that, the Greek, that the, the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. That Hebrew Scripture made three points. These are nicely encapsulated in three Greek infinitives having to do with the idea of Jesus uh, suffering, his rising from the dead, and then finally that repentance and forgiveness of shin, sins should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. But keep reading. You are witnesses of these things, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. promise of the Father in the context in which the Scripture is invoked is the promise of the Scripture coming into and indwelling the lives of God's people that is a sign of the new era. Now, if you have any doubt about that, just keep reading. Go to Acts chapter 1. Once again, Jesus is appearing to the disciples in chapter 1, and in verse 3 it says, To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. That's exactly what Jesus talked to them about in Luke 24, 49 which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Bing, 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 bing. That's Luke 3.16 coming at you again. That's John the Baptist saying, the way you will know that the Christ has come is the one who baptizes with the Spirit and with fire. And now Jesus is saying, before many days from now, you will be baptized with the Spirit. That's the promise of the Father. That's the promise of the Father I told you about that I said you need to be clothed with power from on high. Now, of course, in Acts chapter 2, we get the descent of the Spirit. I'm not going to read a passage from Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to summarize it. But in Acts chapter 2, Peter makes the point to Israel that Israel can now know that God has made this one whom they crucified, both Lord and Christ, because he has poured out the Spirit that they now see upon them. The sign of the new era has arrived. The promise of the Father from the Hebrew Scripture has come. Or we can go to, Luke, to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Here, Peter is describing the descent of the Spirit on Cornelius and the Gentiles, which caused no little trouble among some Jews who were nervous that Gentiles could be a part of God's people. In Acts, 15, Acts 11 and verse 15, it says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Bing, 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 bing. That's Luke 3.16 coming at you yet again. The Spirit of God into the lives of people, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the core of the good news, the new life that God gives that enables us to walk and talk and fellowship with the living God. It goes on and says, if then God gave the same gift to them, he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard this, they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles, God has also granted repentance unto life. Or we could go to Acts 16. I'm not going to take you through that speech of Pisidia Antioch, but it's a very precise speech. Paul goes to Pisidia Antioch and he begins to relate the history of Israel. He starts with God's choice of Israel. And then he talks about their stay in the land of Egypt. And then he talks about their wandering in the wilderness. And then he talks about their coming into the land of Canaan. And then he talks about the period of the judges and Samuel the prophet. And then he talks about Saul. And then he talks about David. And when he gets to David, he's been so precise in how he's gone through the history, you think, well, Solomon is certainly next. And then the split of the kingdoms. And then the prophets. But he doesn't do that. When he gets to David, he stops and he engages in an Olympic broad jump of 1,000 years. 
In verse 22 of chapter 13, he says, And when he removed him, had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will of this man's posterity. God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had preached a baptism of repentance to all the people. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no, but one is coming after me the th sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Bing, 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 bing. That's Luke 3.16 coming at you yet again. And we know the rest of the passage by now because we've read Luke Acts carefully. And we know that the rest of it says, I baptize with water, but there's one coming after me who's going to baptize with the Spirit and with fire. Well, that's Luke and Acts and Jesus and John the Baptist talking about what the gospel is. What does Paul have to say? Well, to set this up, I want to take you to Pompeii. In Pompeii, which is a typical city of the first century that we have the remains of, if you go to the forum, you will find nothing but a series of temples. Here is the temple of Jupiter with Mount Vesuvius in the background that's at the hub of the forum. Here is the temple to Apollo. In the ancient world, Greco-Roman people believed that you needed to relate to as many gods as you could because they all covered different specialties. And it was important to relate to as many of them as possible to be sure all your bases were covered. That's theological terminology. Here's the temple to Venus also in Pompeii. Here's the temple Fortuna Augusta, also in Pompeii. Here's the temple to Vespasian, one of the emperors after the time of Christ towards the end of the first century. Here is a temple to Isis, an Egyptian goddess who was worshiped at Pompeii. Pompeii is located just outside Naples in Italy. Here is the temple to the public Lars, here is the villa to the mystery religions. Here is the room where the mysteries were celebrated. And most importantly, and perhaps least well known, here's a niche in a house where Lars for the family, little idol gods, were worshipped on a daily basis with sacrifices offered daily. In the Greco-Roman world, you literally related to as many gods as you could, as often as you could, both civic gods, gods who looked over the fate of the nation, as well as gods in your home. There were gods everywhere. The ancient world is not like our secular world. The ancient world was filled with idols, all of whom represented gods, all of whom appealed to a fundamental relationship that was both civic, national, personal, and familial in the ancient world. What does Paul have to say about this? In the book of Thessalonians, Paul says it this way in chapter 1. We know, starting in verse 4, we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you, in that our gospel did not come to you merely in words, but in power, and in the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction, Surely you recall the character we displayed when we came among you to help you. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. And when you received the message with joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, despite a great affliction, for from you the message of the Lord has echoed forth, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place reports of your faith in God have spread so that we do not need to say anything. For people everywhere report, how you welcomed us and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's the response to the gospel that Paul is commending. And when they turned and they believed, they believed and left all those associations, all those civic, national, familial, and personal connections behind and said, I believe in the one God and what he's done in Jesus Christ. To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, our deliverer from the coming wrath. Now, this raises for me a very important passage, and that passage is in Romans chapter 1. 
Turn with me to Romans chapter 1, please. The text reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For years, I misread this passage. I read it like this. For I am ashamed of the gospel, for it is the salvation of God to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I had no idea what the word power was doing in that verse. And then it dawned on me that I should read Romans like an epistle, not like an epistle, but like a theological story, a narrative. And then I got it. Here's the story. In the beginning, people are dead in their trespasses and sins and in need of Christ. They are hard-hearted. Now, how much power does a spiritual power, does a dead body have? None. Nix. Nine. Nada. Technical term. Schmatz. No power. That's Romans 1 to 3. If you go to Romans 3, 4, and 5, you get the Declaration of Justification, which talks about faith in Jesus Christ, about His death for sin, the forgiveness that He gives, etc. And then the story goes on. This is still Paul's Gospel. The story goes on to talk about the sanctification of the work of the power of the Spirit, so that by the time we're in Romans 8, we are no longer talking about people who have no power. But we are talking about people indwelt by the Spirit of God who have power and the capability to walk with God. In fact, they are so able to walk with God, there is no need for any law. The reason Paul is jazzed about the gospel is because it is the power of God unto life. And the good news is the offer of new life to the believer that comes as a result of Jesus' death for sin but without the life and the spirit alongside the death for sin, all I've given is half the gospel. Let me illustrate it for you with the two sacraments that the church uses to remember what it is that Jesus Christ has done. First, the table. The table declares Jesus' death, and it does it in the background of Passover. Passover is the time of the Exodus, the first great salvation act of God. But now we have Jesus. Think about this for a second. Jesus takes a rite, a sacred rite of Israel, and totally transforms it. Who has the authority to do that? Think about that in your spare time. That's a Christological point. Anyway, he totally transforms it and reshapes it in terms of the significance of his death which gives the disciples the right to sit at table with him and fellowship. My point is, is that death for sin is like an invitation that invites you to a banquet table. But who goes to a banquet table to sit down at the meal and say, I'm done? No, you come to the table to fellowship, to enjoy the meal, to declare yourselves as part of God's family and who it is that you're a part of. And when we talk about the Lord's table, not only as a memorial meal, but as a proclamation, what it proclaims is, I am able to sit at the table and sup with God because of what he has done. I am able to take life, the bread of life discourse of the gospel of John. We might as well throw John in there. We've mentioned Paul, we've mentioned Jesus, we mentioned John the Baptist. That's the table, but baptism's my favorite. Baptism's great. Down in the water, dead to sin. Now, if the gospel were only about death for sin, <laughs> Romans 6. Alive to God. Amen. The gospel, it's simple, but it's profound. 
And the gift that we do not talk enough about is the gift not just of life, but empowerment, enablement. Enablement that comes from the Spirit coming into the life and working on me from within, creating in me a heart that says, Abba, Father, a sense of adoption, and creating in me the ability to walk with the living God. And Paul is jazzed about the gospel, not because it's a transaction. You know, sometimes the church gets what it pays for when it offers the gospel. And when we offer it as a transaction and a check of a box, people check the box and say, I've done the important thing, and they risk walking away. And the gospel is about more than checking a box. It's about coming into a room. It's about sitting at a table. I want to close with an illustration that shows my indebtedness to the Old Testament and the Hebrew Scripture. Because I'm convinced you do not understand the New Testament unless you understand the Old. Let's go back to that picture of washing. You know, in the Old Testament, there's a lot that's said about purity. We don't spend much time talking about purity and cleanliness, being unclean, etc. But the picture in the background is important. Because when you are unclean in the Old Testament, you cannot fellowship with God. You cannot go into the temple. But when you participate in that washing or you participate in that sacrifice that removes the impediment, or in some cases when time just passes, and you become declared clean, the point is not simply to say you're clean now, you can go on with your life. The point of cleanliness is to put you in position to be able to go back into the temple and fellowship with the living God. The gospel is the good news that the creature who has been out of touch with the creator can reconnect with the living God and be empowered with him as a member of his family through what Jesus Christ has done. You can't leave the death of Jesus out of the gospel and have the gospel. But also, that you can be empowered with the Spirit of God who enables you to have life, life everlasting. One final point. In the gospel of John, when Jesus is uttering his last prayer before he goes to the cross, at the very beginning, he says this. Father, the hour has come, 17.1. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him power over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The gospel is about knowing God and the power that the Father gives through the Son in the Spirit that makes it happen. So, when you preach the good news, when I preach the good news, and we think about how great our God is, let's not forget the Father sent the Son so that the Son could send the Spirit so that we could have life. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness, your grace, that life is a gift, not only the forgiveness of sins, but the provision of the Spirit that lets us in our hearts cry out to you links us to you, seals us to you, destines us for you. The world desperately needs good news. The good news of what you have done through your Son and by your Spirit. Help us to preach it well. Help us to live it in such a way that it is visible so that people may see our good deeds, as Jesus said, and praise you in heaven. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.